Caitlin, I'm excited to have you here today. And for the people watching this too that don't know you, um, I want to start by saying you are one of my heroes. I tell you this all the time and you tell me you're no hero, but you are uh, one of my heroes uh, because I'm, I'm growing up in law enforcement, working with military, special forces, Navy SEALs, you, you name it. I've met some incredible um, American war heroes, but for what we do at Armored One, you're one of my heroes because you save lives at, 10 years ago now. Um, it's crazy to me that the 10 year anniversary of the Sandy Hook Elementary attack was 10 years ago and I learned about you um, watching TV in my living room that night as the news came on and back 10 years ago I was working for the police and uh, doing SWAT training police officers on active shooter how to respond to a school how to take out a threat stop a threat as quick as possible um, to save lives because of course law enforcement has been aware since 1999 at Columbine that this is a problem but they haven't been addressing it right and watching you that night is the reason one of the reasons Armored One exists was because of um, me watching you and, and the story that you shared um, on the news I think it was Diane Sawyer am I right it was. that yeah. that you the night of the shooting um, you shared that story and we're going to share some of it mm -hmm. today with them a little bit but I wanted to talk to you about what you've been doing since and your family and uh, you're not for profit on what you're doing, even your book. So, but you are one of my heroes. You saved 15 kids in your classroom that day by thinking fast, um, being calm, and and fighting through probably, I pray, the hardest situation you ever have in your life. So, I'm glad you're here and you're finally at Armored One, and you get to see what we've developed over 10 years here in this Armored One headquarters in Syracuse, New York. So, welcome here, and I'm I'm glad you're with us. Thanks, Tom. You know, hero is not a word that I relate to in any way. You know, I firmly believe 10 years later that I did what any teacher would do, right? I mean, you're a teacher, you go into teaching because you want to help kids, right? In mm -hmm. any way possible. And they're your responsibility, those eight hours that they're with you or seven hours um, in that day. And so on that day, what arose was terror, mm -hmm. right? And imminent danger and so my job very quickly turned to taking care of them and yeah. I really you know I think that's what any teacher would have done in that moment. I, I, um, I really believe too that a lot of teachers would but now over 10 years of doing this and studying over 40 years of this not every teacher and school staff member has acted the same and with the same bravery um, and with the same speed of response I guess we could say too that you did. Well you know the definition of bravery. What is it? Acting in the face of fear. So you're a teacher well, courage, all the time, right? Courage, bravery. They're pretty similar, pretty close. though. Yeah, but people will say that to me all the time. You know, you're so courageous. And I'm like, well, do you know the definition? At least my definition, the one that I've coined. Um, it's acting in the face of fear. It's being afraid and doing it anyway, right? Yep. That's real courage, right? Absolutely. Like, you're terrified, but you do it anyway. Yes, definitely. You know, like, I'm scared to death of things all, you know, all the time in my yep. daily life, but you do it anyway, because where's it going to get you? Where is letting the fear hold you back going to, oh, I agree. Going to bring you and nowhere? That, that's so. the same. I was actually talking with some of my older kids, the ones in their 20s now, um, about it, and they had friends with them, and one of the friends had said, your dad's really brave, as we're talking police, some police stories. I, I said, boys, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't brave. I said, what it was was just pushing through the fear. And part of it too was knowing that could I li re really live with the decision that I made if I didn't do what I was supposed to be doing sure. at that point. And that, I think that's same for you too of um, I know how much you love student, not only your students in that class that year, yeah. but now with your oh. classes for classes mm -hmm. that we'll talk about later, you're not yeah. for profit, that you love the students across America, across the world that you've even tried to help and, and make a difference with. So I think that instinctive, it was before you were mom, but that mom was in you um, with those children before, and that, that bravery and that courage pushed through in that shining moment. Um, you know, tragedy and shining moment, and I, I say that because the parents of those kids in that room, I'm sure, are forever grateful yeah. for yeah. the decision that you made, the actions that you made, and the bravery that you showed, so. But they, I do. They have shared their, many of them have shared their gratitude, which now being a mom is, you know, I, I understood it back then. I really did. I was 29 at the time of the shooting. It's crazy. And when they would reach out and they would, you know, send me an email or they'd send me a handwritten note, I really understood the gravity of it, even then, even not having kids, because I knew how much was lost on that day. Oh. And I knew how close we had come to losing our lives. So it was really an awareness of, you know, like, we do need to be so appreciative that mm -hmm. the 16 of us are here, right? And I understand that sentiment. I understand the sentiment Absolutely. of like, 
I'm you know, so thankful that you and my child are here. Um, but certainly I think being a mom, it is, you know, makes it even, even, even larger than that, right? Mm -hmm. Just the... Probably brings you back to, you know, about five years later you become a mother, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it kind of brings you back to the realization of what really went on for those parents mm -hmm. that day and, and really what a difference that you were able to make by, by saving lives. And I, I want to I share, and I know some of it's hard to talk about, and we've mm -hmm. talked about it many times before, mm -hmm. and um, you've helped us at Armored One and at One Training for, mm -hmm. for teaching schools and helping them, and you really are the, my favorite training for schools out that. there because, well, it really does, peer-to-peer, -peer, having those teachers hear your story from you. But what I love, too, is that, you know, people love to say you need to move on, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what do you say? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things I learned very early on in my healing journey, right, was that, and it was probably within the first month, I mean, not that I could clearly articulate it, but in my mind thinking back, it was very early on, I realized a huge difference um, for me, every single day of my life since December 14th, 2012, mm -hmm. I will move forward from that day, yeah. but I will never move on, mm -hmm. right? Like I lived through this thing that wholly became a part of me. It's every second of every minute of every single day. That's why, that's why I come and I talk to you. That's why I started mm -hmm. class for classes. That's why I wrote a book. That's why I go out and I share my story because it, it doesn't go anywhere. Right. And I think that that's the same for every person who has lived through a trauma or a tragedy, which let's be honest, is most of us, yeah. small or big, right? And, and, and everywhere in between, small or large, everywhere in between. Um, but our society does a really poor job with this, right? Okay. We say things to people like, it's been 10 years, you must be feeling so much better. You know, you've gone to therapy, you're doing yoga. Oh, you started <laughs> taking anxiety med. You know, like, oh, you're over it, right? You've yep. moved on. And it's so insensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I know that I'm not the only one who feels this way. Yep. I don't think people talk about it, right? We're expected to sort of move on, right? Yep. Something happened and you, you, you pick up the pieces and you move on. And people say really insensitive things like, everything happens for a reason, oh, yeah. right? No, nope, there is absolutely not one reason in, in the entire universe that could explain what happened on that day at our school, not one. Um, so, you know, I think we just need to do a better job as a whole, right, as oh, a yeah. society of helping people to understand, A, that you're not alone once you've lived through something really hard, right, yep. that everybody does on some scale, that you're wholly allowed to have the feelings that you're feeling, and that if they haven't gone anywhere in a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, that's okay too, right? You learn to live with it mm -hmm. in a new way, right? Like. You don't lay down and you know eat bonbons the rest of your life, but you move forward with a you know a different purpose, a renewed purpose, a new yep. way of seeing the world. And I think we need to do a much better job at that. I agree, and I, I really think too that the world, the media, has done a bad job of mm -hmm. we move on, we move on. And totally. and I was grateful that you and I were friends prior to my brother dying at 40 years old six years ago now, and people within weeks saying you've moved on, you can get back to work, you can. And I loved it because you, that was one of the staples in my brain from going to so many shootings now. I, I just hit um, that shooting down in Newport News, Virginia, which I know you don't follow yeah. too many because it's traumatic, but a six-year-old shot his oh, teacher I did intentionally. See that. I did see that. And I responded up there, um, went up to the scene. That was my 60th in 10 years, 60th um, school shooting that I've been to. And we're barely touching them, too. And I go to a majority of the major ones, but this one being such a young kid and child that was um, the suspect that I went to it. But going to those and hearing people saying, move on, move on, there's, there's trauma I live with from being at these scenes, going to Sandy Hook um, within a couple days of the shooting and talking to people and seeing how hurt they are. And, and then when my brother passes away, people saying it's been a, it's a year anniversary, you know. You've moved on from this. There is no moving on. There's definitely moving forward, and you're always carrying it, and there's nothing wrong with carrying it. And I agree with you, too. There, there is no reason. I always say to people when they say, what's, what's the reason behind active shooter and school shootings? Um, the active shooter, 100%, is pure evil. Whether you believe in God or not, you can't explain Correct. what went on at your school, what went on at um, Parkland, in Uvalde, oh, at these schools. It's just it's a pure evil um, trying to ruin us. So. You know, 
even if we rewind before, before Sandy Hook, <clears throat> why did you want to be a teacher? Oh, we're going way back. Going way back. <laughs> we're going way back. Um, I, you know, I don't want to say I, I always knew, but from a very early age, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. Let's call it five. Um, and so, you know, I did what all kids do. For me, the acting out was all these stuffed animals, and I'd pile them all around, and I had a whiteboard hung on the wall, and I'd, you know, teach them words and, you know, model myself after my teachers in school, in kindergarten and first grade. Um, I think as all teachers, you have you have the teachers who inspired you. Mm -hmm. And I certainly had that. I would say definitely three teachers really stand out in my mind. I'll share briefly about one of Please. the three. Um, and it's interesting because one was in um, elementary school, one was in high school, and one was at the college level. So it's kind of interesting how that, and obviously by college I had firmly decided, but oh, definitely yeah. my, you know, my teacher in elementary and high school played this real pivotal role in really solidifying that yes, this is what you're I, supposed I want to, do. to be a teacher. Oh, yeah. um, so my fifth grade teacher was Mrs. Bollier, and she was really the teacher who just like ignited that fire under me, who made me say in fifth grade, like, yes, I've known since five that I really you know, want to be a teacher, but nope, now, now it's 100%. She really, she inspired, mm -hmm. she motivated, and I think what was most important was that she made it look so effortless, so seamless, right? She built this really caring community within her classroom where yeah. everyone felt safe and welcome and really a part of her team like we were all on her team and i think the most important thing about her was that you know obviously she taught us academics and she read us incredible literature and she did all of that but she genuinely cared about us and you could feel that in yeah. the way that if you had a conversation with her and you know in fifth grade is kind of a hard year right like you're Transition. about to go to middle school mm -hmm. it's sort of people are starting to be mean which doesn't really happen before fifth grade anywho i transgressed but you know she really she really got to know you in the way that you'd have a conversation with her and she'd come back over a week later and she'd you know kneel down with you and she'd say you know i've, I've really been thinking a lot about X, Y, and Z, and here's what I think you should do. Like, she yeah. genuinely cared. I remember at the beginning of the year, one of our very first assignments was we had to make a me box. And so we had to fill a shoe box with, you know, full of items that explain who yeah. we are as an individual. It yeah. was, I still remember to this day because it was the absolute, probably one of the best moments in my entire educational career because somebody actually cared about who I was and wanted to know about me and wanted me to share it with my peers. Yeah. Like I, I still remember the feeling of sharing that box and I kept everything in there the whole year, like at my house. Um, it was almost, just such Almost a, like your first time teaching because you're sharing it and teaching, it showing, about sharing with the class, right? Yeah, but it was more like she cared about me and, and I knew that she cared about everyone else, right? Because she, she was taking yeah. time out of her instructional time to say, no, we're gonna spend you know, the next week, every morning, you know, half an hour a morning for four kids to share wow. their me boxes. Um, so she, you know, and we're still friendly. Like we're friends on Instagram. Awesome. She now has, um, I hate misquoting things. I think she has MS. She's confined to a wheelchair. Oh. And can't, has no use of her arms or her legs. Oh. Um, but we get together, she, Graceland's, my daughter has met her a few times and you know, we'll have a bite to eat and just chat. And so I think that's, I don't know, I think that speaks volumes about educators, right? So, I mean, so she was my knew, fifth grade teacher, well, that's I'm the thing, be 40. Being so young <laughs> so and old. that you're still tied to her, <laughs> that how much it meant to you and, and your driving force yeah. of teaching, yeah. that, that is amazing. And There's a chapter in Choosing Hope called Mrs. Is it Mrs. Bullier or Mrs. B? Regardless, it's I think all it was about Mrs. Her. B. I've read it's the book a couple her. times and I actually think it's Mrs. Bollier and I spelled is her it? name wrong. I think I spelled her name wrong. Because <laughs> at the time the next, we weren't in touch. The next print you're Well, it's a French it. name and it's sort of, there's a lot of like EAUs anyway. So yeah. We're gonna need to pause real quick. Oh. So Caitlin, going into <clears throat> December 14th of 2012, you've been a teacher for how long at this point? Um, so I had taught at Sandy Hook. It was my sixth year at Sandy Hook, my seventh year teaching. overall teaching. Okay. Mm -hmm. I started so you're very familiar by then, six years mm -hmm. <clears throat> at one school. Mm -hmm. You're very familiar. I mean, you've had kids go all the way through the school and they're mm -hmm. out by then, right? So Correct. recycled, brand new kids. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say you're pretty seasoned by that point. Even though you were so young, yeah. you're pretty seasoned at, yeah. at teaching. Yeah. And you're teaching that day. Was there anything off? I mean, from the time you got up to um, what happened, was there anything special, different about that day? Something that felt off to you? Um, Nothing felt off. No, I woke up, I would say it was probably a more joyous day, which is, right, what is that, a juxtaposition where two things are so polarly opposite, yeah. right? 
So I woke up that morning, it was a Friday. It was like 10 days before Christmas, which my family and I celebrate Christmas. Um, we were heading out, my mom and I were heading out to look at wedding stuff that weekend. So you Saturday, were engaged, yeah. Yep, I was newly engaged, well, four months engaged. Um, so it was, I, I just felt like on top of the world, mm -hmm. right? Like you, I got my wedding dress, I'm getting ready for the holidays with my family. I'm just feeling Vacation's coming happy. soon, yeah. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to, the reading specialist was coming to my room that day, which is a really big deal, right? To see how you're running centers and how you're running reading groups yeah. and are all the kids engaged? So I'd been, you know, prepping them for, it's a big deal. You've yeah. been pre I've been prepping my kids for like a week for that, really getting them ready. And she was supposed to come in about 9.40. Okay. And so I was getting ready to leave my house. Um, it was around 7 a.m. just prior, and I looked out. We lived on the water, Long Island Sound, and I looked out, and the sun was rising, and I put down my stuff, and I got my phone. Um, Blackberry didn't really take very good <laughs> pictures. And I took a picture, and I posted it to Facebook, and I like rushed out the door. And three hours later, everything was done. So it's that, that beautiful of a morning that you actually stop what you're doing to take a picture. Mm -hmm. And post it on Facebook. So you you get into you get into work and you know some of them some of the people watching or listening might have heard you say too I was the first classroom right mm -hmm. but what does that mean you you come into the main entrance of the school and you say you're the first classroom is there yeah. one hallway or two hallways how did it how yeah, did it I can work explain and, it. Um, so I arrived at school that morning about eight o'clock my students would be arriving an hour later at nine. Um, so when you walked in the front door of our school so we had two large glass doors and then we had a large wall of windows. Mm -hmm. And so when you walked through the front doors, there was another set of doors. So we had two sets of locked doors. Yep. So you walk through both, and then you'd come to the end of like a five foot brick wall, not long at all, yep. and you would take that left, the hallway here. There was a hallway over here, but you would take that first left, and my classroom was the first door. So wow. my, cl my classroom's door was, you know, 12 feet from the front door. And the offices were right there too, The office right? was right the... in front. So it wasn't even, it so was just is, right this there. this is your main entrance. And what they're seeing a lot now, and I, I would say, um, Sandy Hook was ahead of the swing for a mm -hmm. controlled vestibule, a secure vestibule, mm -hmm. or what they felt was secure, you know, mm -hmm. Very. with what we do with glass, they're, they're under the assumption that glass is going to protect you, but it's for rule followers, and sadly they didn't know it at that time, but they, they're feeling safe. They almost well, I have... Think, I think, can I just, because I think it's a good time definitely. to say this. So I think there's this huge misconception. I know there is. I don't know how large it goes, but there's a big misconception that Sandy Hook was this laissez-faire, idyllic school in the countryside, and our doors were unlocked, and we were like, oh, come mm -hmm. on in, welcome. No, mm -hmm. that was not Sandy Hook. Um, Sandy Hook was always locked. We had, right next to the first locked front door, we had video surveillance, voice recognition. You were not getting through there unless one of the three secretaries knew who you were, yep. right? Or you were showing your ID and explaining to them who you were, yep. and then they had to buzz you in. Correct. I the individual that. went away from that area and shot his way through a window and climbed through, yep. which is the only reason, by the way, that I'm here today. Because I heard him shooting his way through that window, which yep. took him about two and a half minutes, from what I'm told. You would probably know. And he went back, got more whatever, and then he climbed through. So I probably had three minutes, and in that three minutes, that's when we hid. Yep. I, he would have been in my classroom yep. and I would have had nothing. Because he engaged, he engaged victims too in that lobby area. He did, but that was outside, like, that wouldn't have given was, me the time right. to hide. And you, you too, you're that first classroom um, that's just beyond. And, and what's crazy now, so I told you 60 shootings that have investigated, been on the grounds, talked to people um, that were there. And they immediately say too that, I thought it was fireworks. I thought it was a car backfiring. Um, I thought they were doing construction. And when we asked them to, has anyone ever set off fireworks at the school during the day? Why would you think it's fireworks? Mm -hmm. You know, it's now 2023. Mm -hmm. um, but even back then in 2010, we've had plenty of shootings since Columbine, even going before that, Jonesboro, Arkansas, at the elementary school. So you hear gunshots, and, and I tell you this because right now, teachers, school staff members, are their brain is protecting them. They're trying to justify what they're hearing and what's going on. But you hear loud noises, and what does your brain say? Is it gunshot, is it not a gunshot? Well, I think, you know, my experience, I'm always very candid about this, my, my students and my experience was very, very different. So Sandy Hook was this enormous school, the mm -hmm. footprint. When I first started teaching there, there were 800 kids K-4. Wow. Seven sections of each grade. This is a massive school. Yep. 
my proximity enabled me to know what it is, as well as my dad being a proud gun owner, like, yep. you know, hearing the gun range. So I know what a gun sounds mm -hmm. like. And I lived through Columbine um, as a high school student in Connecticut, right, mm -hmm. removed, but understanding I'm in high school, this is happening in high school. Yep. It was like etched in my brain, yep. terrifying. So the first thing I thought when I heard, you know, I can't claim that it was the first shot fired, but you know, as I'm hearing the shots, I know exactly. And I thought Columbine's happening here. How could that be possible? And, like and, how could that be possible? And I, I give you a lot of credit for that because I'm talking to hundreds of people where it's outside their hallway. It's right, and, and part of it is a denial too, a protection and a denial that it's not happening. And I, I was out of high school by the time Columbine happened, but that was such a big deal nationwide. And that really was like the media spread of what's going on with active shooter and shooting that it, it made such an um, impression in your mind mm -hmm and in your soul almost back then, that it was something that you always did not want to happen, mm -hmm. um, that you were aware of, and that awareness is a big thing because I think that helps with situational awareness of uh -huh. knowing what's going on around you, but then being able to then discern, is this gonna hurt me or not hurt me? And it could be something as slippery ice outside and someone falling or hearing gunshots all of a sudden, but you hear those gunshots and what, what was your reaction? Well, first, what was your backtrack. training? I have to backtrack. Okay, we I'm can good talk with about training too. Well, no, because you touched on something that I think is important to share more about. All right. Um, so awareness, right? Mm -hmm. And my therapist helped me to see this. So I'd never gone to therapy, but clearly after December 14th, I needed a lot of help with many different things. Oh, yeah. So I started seeing a therapist. My fiance at the time came with me because I couldn't go anywhere alone. And one of the things she pointed out to me was that I have been this, she calls it hypervigilant, but awareness, mm -hmm. kind of the same thing. Um, I have been a hypervigilant person my entire life. I have always lived my life thinking that the worst possible thing is gonna happen. And until December 14th, it never had, right? So I'm the person who, although fiercely independent, I'll go into New York City and I'll get a weird feeling about the cab driver and I get out. Yeah. I'm driving my car and instead of going behind the car, I park eight feet behind it so that if that person got out to hurt me, I could easily pull around. I go into a restaurant, a movie theater or wherever and I see, I know I'm facing the exit so I know mm -hmm. who's coming in and out. Then she pointed that out. Then I started doing work with yourself, with lots of different first responders and, and mm -hmm. mili you know, military and uh, police officers, firefighters, and they all said to me, well, those are things that those are things that we do. Like you're, oh, yeah. you're just innately doing that. And I think it stems back to being adopted. Mm -hmm. um, that was the other thing that my, my uh, therapist tied it to because when you're adopted for the first however long, you know, maybe it's your whole life, I don't know, but I think you know, the first few months, you're, you're constantly looking and aware of where your mother is, mm -hmm. her voice, and, and she's not there. And so you're trying to like make sense of that. And so it causes a lot of ad adoptees to have this hyper oh, yeah. vigilance. So I'm like, oh, well, that'll, so I'm like, oh, well, I've been thinking the worst possible thing's gonna happen my whole life. And now I just actually he, lived through it. One of my good friends is adopted. And one of the fears he had for years and years was that all of this happiness is gonna end. And where, where you were just saying too, you felt like something bad was gonna happen. I wonder too, with that, the adoption, the adopted kid, mm -hmm this is too good to be true, that it can't be this perfect, it can't be this good. And he too was looking for something bad, being aware of it, I, I say, but yours, you're describing situational awareness, mm -hmm. which is excellent because you're abs absolutely describing it. And the level that you took it to, I would say post-shooting, working with so many law enforcement, I, and I know you worked with FBI, I mean, you've met people from all over, that's called combat mindset. What we train in the police academy is situational awareness of knowing what's going on around you and taking that, discerning it. And then from there, a combat mindset of something bad can happen, what am I going to do to do it? And right. what's great is you almost had that combat mindset when Definitely. these gunshots went off because I remember you saying, I think you were reading a story that morning, right? And you were opposite side, and I'll let you tell it way better than me, but you're not near your keys. Yeah. Um, you know, just some questions for you to touch on as you tell it, but what did they train you for, for active shooter? What was your lockdown looking like? Were your doors locked and closed during the day? Were you allowed to lock your door? You know, yeah. what, what did they have for policies and stuff? Because it, I wanna talk about the changes that have happened in 13 years mm -hmm. now, or yeah. 10 years since that, but um, when it went on. Yeah, I would say Sandy Hook was ahead of the curve, looking back I to agree. 2012. I would say that Sandy Hook took school safety very, very seriously. Um, we did lots of different drills, but specifically we did two lockdown drills, fall and spring, every year from the time I started. So I had done, what, 12 um, by the time December 14th had happened. Our lockdown drill was 
to close our door to lock it, which you needed a key to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's a little tricky. In the hallway or in your room? In the room. Okay. Uh, no, in the hallway. So you had to walk out, which is a lot no, of... No, I don't remember. Okay. I don't want to lie. Still still a lot of classrooms, though, in, in America. You have to walk into the hallway with a key. I know you need the key. To lock it and close it. But I don't remember from which side, And I remember Because I remember you. your keys were on the desk. Correct. Yep. Yeah. I don't remember which side, okay. but it had to be locked with a key, which is a problem. Yep. We were instructed, so every classroom door had a circle window at the top, about maybe two feet. On the top. Um, mm -hmm. yep. And so we were instructed to cover that with a large piece of construction paper. That was okay. part of the lockdown drill. Um, and then we were to go in front of our cubby area, which was kind of right in from the door, not far at all, and to have the students crouch down on their like hands and knees, bracing their heads. Mm -hmm. We would have been sitting ducks. It would have yeah. done absolutely nothing for us. Um, the one saving grace I will say is that being a first grade teacher and being very busy, I had put a blue piece of construction paper over the door during our fall lockdown drill and I had never gotten around to taking it off. That's good. So it was there. Yeah. So, you know, do I still believe that he came into our classroom? I do. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine, because the door was unlocked, I can't imagine that he bypassed classroom one just to go to two and three. It doesn't make sense. Um, I, I actually talked to quite a few of the cops out there and they're, every one of them agreed that they think that he at least the door looked, was open. looked into your Correct. room. Right. And, it, and I had closed it for sure. Yep. So, so either he opened it or someone else. Yep, and they believe that he, he <clears throat> popped his head in there, at least looked. And the way that you position that you're gonna describe here about positioning that bookcase in front of the bathroom door. Um, Which was terrifying. One of the cops that I talked to said he actually looked in the room quick when they were doing the fast sweep, didn't see any students and didn't see, even see that door. So he assumed that there was no one there. And I don't, you probably didn't even hear them in the room at that point, but the thing is is that, <sighs> It's, it's crazy to think that um, your actions, all of it, even Sandy, Sandy Hook, I will give them credit because they're way ahead of the curve because there's a lot of schools that still will not do what Sandy Hook did back then and it was still such a tragic event. I don't think about that moment a lot of pulling that bookcase because it was like a very last minute decision and I was really terrified of making that decision because all I kept thinking was this is either going to save us or kill us. Because if the person knows this school, they'll know that I pulled it in from. Mm -hmm. And so, then we're in there. As an expert, Kate oh, does this. We might need to take a break. That's okay. As, oh. as, one, of the, as one of the experts on this, I will tell you those actions 100% saved oh. your life and those kids. Because we even teach, we do not want people going into a dead end like a closet or a bathroom where there's no way out. And we say that because of even what happened at your school, but it's oh happened in a few, that we would rather them try to get out or barricade and have a way. And what you did is you hid them, you barricaded them, and you kept them quiet, which was absolutely amazing. And that what we tell people is using you as an example for 10 years now of you're an example of why barricading is so important. This barricade hid the door and made it, made it so that he didn't know it was there. It gave you another layer of protection and I know the door was an in-swing door too that, mm -hmm. that you stuffed um, these kids into. So you're, you're in that room and you hear the gunshots and your kids are on the floor and you're reading. No, or you're, oh, so it was our morning meeting. Morning meeting, that's what it was. So morning okay. meeting is a really, morning meeting is a component of responsive classroom, which mm -hmm. many schools partake in. Sandy Hook always, I think from the very first year I had taught there, bought into it full force, right? Like every classroom. Uh, did responsive classroom and it's really just a way of and it's not simple there's many components but it's it's a community building um, tool yep and one of the most important cornerstones is the morning meeting yep. and so morning meeting has different parts and so every morning I would when my students were working on morning meeting I would put on a song to signal that when the song's over they need to be seated in morning meeting yep. And that was, oh, what a beautiful morning. So we let us know, oh, what, oh, what a beautiful morning every morning. The song ends, they're all circled up, crisscross applesauce, hands in their bowl. And so we would first greet one another, um, and they would always choose what greeting that they wanted mm -hmm. to, to do. They loved ball roll, that was their favorite. Then we would do our morning message, which was on our smart board, which would have been, like if I'm sitting here, it would have been right behind me. And I would have a student come up and help me with the morning message because there would be blanks, things that needed to be filled in. And so the students would all help to fill yeah. in. 
we would read through it together, talk about our day. That day, obviously, we were talking a lot about this visit, right? Like, mm -hmm. I remember just being like tunnel vision on like, we need to get through this and it needs to go well. And does everyone know what they need to be doing? And you're a little you know, bit of a perfectionist. Just a small <laughs> bit. Most teachers are. Um, not perfectionist, type A. Yes, type definitely a. type A. And so uh, after that, then we had share. And so my students that week were sharing about holiday traditions and what they were really looking forward to, what they were going to do with their families. And it was right, I think, my memory is it was in the midst of that wow. as they were sharing their holiday traditions. And it had to have been loud because it's so, so loud. close. It was so loud and it was just over and over and over. And so, again, I didn't, so now when I look back and I can see where that individual parked the car, I know why, I had no idea because he was, he was over there, right? Mm -hmm. And my windows didn't start. So I couldn't, I physically couldn't see the car and I couldn't see him, yep. thank God. Um, and so I heard it and I immediately, I got up, I closed the door. I turned to my I turned the light off. I turned to my students and I said, we need to get in the bathroom. We need to get in there right now. Cause there was no other choice. Like I know what I'm hearing. I thought it was multiple people too, by the way. I did not yeah. think it was a lone gunman. I thought it was multiple guns because it was so loud. So many and so loud. So loud. And so I turned to them and I said, we have to hide. Because there was no, obviously if I thought running had been an option, I would have. Mm -hmm. But I knew we would have been either running towards him yep. or we would have been running with our backs down a very long hallway and we would have been a fight, like he would have, you know, I don't know it, who this is. But I that, don't know like that is a what their level absolutely of. Absolutely great decision. And <coughs> we'll get a lot in training where teachers want specific answers to stuff. And we tell, you've gotta, you've gotta oh, absorb what you're looking at and what's going on. Mm -hmm. And this is where an example too of, if you jumped out of the windows and headed out in the parking lot, there was a time where he was in the parking Correct. lot. He's Which not is going, when we would have been going Right, out. he's not going to kill you because you're only inside. He was looking to kill as many as he could. Correct. So not going that way was a great decision. And exactly, if you went out, you couldn't get out the closest exit, which was next to you. Correct. And you're down a shooting tunnel at that point. Correct. So you didn't have much of a choice. And our of, windows didn't open. Of I mean, what was going on. They opened. Yeah. But not enough to get out. Correct. I mean, I could have probably shoved some of my tiniest students out through them. I could have never. Maybe break a window I to could get it, but even. it's a lot and it's Knee, break a window. noise. <laughs> break with a nail what, with, with like a, a book. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have anything in my classroom to break, you know, yep. I mean, I don't know. So anyway, so, you know, my students started arguing, not arguing, but like asking, like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. right, right? Like they're hearing it too, but they don't really you know, comprehend obviously the way an adult does. Right. And I'm asking them to get into an impossibly small space. I mean, this is not the right shape because it's a circle, but our classroom bathroom was impossibly small. I mean, it was, it was- Three by five, right? Not even, about... I don't, maybe three by four, I would call it, which is just tiny, you know, until that day, I had never stepped foot inside of it. Well, as tall as you are too, it's Ever. not like it's a bathroom you Because you couldn't use, use and... it comfortably as an yeah. adult. But that was in that moment, the decision that I somehow in a split second made for us to attempt survival far outweighed how unreasonable it seemed for us to fit. That was mm -hmm. our only option. Um, that was it. It was either we were getting in there and closing and locking that door or, cause I knew I didn't have time. I didn't want to take the time to get my keys off my desk, which was in the opposite. You have opposite. no idea where he is. Exactly. Right. And I don't want to, I don't want to take that time. I have no idea what's going on. So. I just, we just all piled in and at the very last second as we were all in, after I realized that the door opened in. So you put them in there before you even went well, in. They right? just all started, everyone just started going in. So two of my students straddled where the flusher is. I think two of my students were standing on the toilet. They were like in the crevices next to it. Wow. Um, and then I sort of, after they were all in and I figured out how to get their bodies behind the door to close it, I obviously was the last one in because I pulled the, the bookcase and I remember so I pulled the bookcase, because it was on wheels, so I'm not strong, it was on wheels. <laughs> I pulled it and I closed the door and I locked it. And I remember I just, I was like standing with my body like against the door, but I remember leaning back against the wall because it wasn't far. Mm -hmm. So I was like leaning over my kids, some of them. And, and for people to even understand, your average elevator is probably more than double the oh, size of the room. Triple, so imagine, triple. imagine you, someone listening to this, getting into an elevator with a teacher 15. and 15 students into awesome. a regular elevator, you would be uncomfortable and would never do it. Nonetheless, less than half the size. Could it, I mean, and after like 10 minutes had passed, like it really intrude. And again, obviously, like we're dealing with like a life and death situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that like 
heightens your senses. Oh, absolutely. But I mean, I remember it being difficult to like take in a deep breath. Yeah. Because it was like, you know, we just have the air coming down the bottom. The and it's heating up with the bodies, with the breathing. And we, most of, you know, I had my fleece on. Mm -hmm. Students had their, you know, because they had just come in. It's winter. I wasn't like the teacher who was like, take your fleece off, you know? So it was like. Everyone's blood pressure's up. So their bodies are heating over. Oh, like. Kidding. So yeah, I mean, you're, you're in there. And, but it doesn't even end there. That's the thing is all the shooting that was going on at the moment that you put the kids in there, that, that was just the beginning of this horrific um, event. And he then makes his way down your hallway. He chooses the, your hallway to come down. Mm -hmm. And as I said, talking to some of the cops there, they, they believe too that he, that went, he, in he in. went into the room, didn't see anything. And they, they want to move on quick. They want an Correct. easy target. They don't want to, beat through a door, beat through a barricade. Right. Um, if you're not there, they know someone's there because school's going on, but where are they? And he moved on. And, and sadly, you were close enough to everything that you could hear what was going on. And it was two rooms, correct, that he went and attacked in. We had an adjoining you. door with classroom two. So one, two, we had an adjoining door. Did he go into that three. adjoining? I don't know. Okay. But he went across the hall from you, right, is where he went and entered those classrooms. He, no, I don't believe he did. The, the carnage was in the hallway right in front of my classroom. Mm -hmm. That's where our principal and our and our excuse me and our school psychologist lost their lives trying to trying stop to him. Trying to stop him. Yep. And trying to tell him no. And then he, I believe, came into mine. And then he went into the second, I believe, through the door, not through the adjoining door. Yep. And then he went into the third. Yeah. That's what I because that's where he killed himself. Yeah. And you. It's right there, right next to you. So right there. there were bullet casings over my floor. I was told, and you you could hear everything yeah. going on. I remember in our podcast too, a difficult one for me is one of the little boys that was the hero. Yeah, and Jesse, Jesse there, and he hears gunshots and he knows that he's he reloading. In too. Right? Do you remember what? I don't. I don't remember. I just remember this. The. the all I can remember people saying were, please no, please no. It's the only thing I remember. Like, oh God, please no. I heard too that Jesse was the one that when he was reloading, yelled he yelled, go. get mm -hmm. out. Yeah. He's reloading, get out, this is a time or something. And he lost And to me. And the kids ran. <laughs> they ran. And to me, a, a first grader reason. that's more concerned to save his friends than himself. Like, what an unbelievable. But, and and, then, but not understanding. Yes, and then like it, not understanding how imminent that danger was. Like understanding, like run, go, but not, not having the wherewithal enough to understand of like, I need to go to you know like mm -hmm. just too young like that. Like what child should ever Can process have? exactly? It's unimaginable. I mean the little, uh, it's unimaginable. And and your kids too. You're hearing it, which means your students are hearing Correct. it. So one little girl started to cry. Obviously, I can't believe they all did. I would have been crying. And I just remember, I thought, no, this cannot happen because they're six, right? And they mm -hmm. lead by example and by modeling. So if one's crying and she keeps crying, they're all gonna start crying. I grabbed her face in my hands and I said, you know, show me your smile. Think really, because you can't be crying if you're smiling. Like think happy thoughts, think mm -hmm. about your mom, think about the holiday you're gonna celebrate, think about present, like just, and she stopped crying. I mean, she was stoic Amazing. and looked like, but she stopped crying and she just. Because you wanted to keep them quiet. They had to be quiet. You did not that want them was, to know where you that were. That was like the only thing we had. Everything yeah. else was unknown, but if we could be quiet, I felt like maybe we had a chance. I didn't, I've told you before, I didn't think we had a chance. Mm -hmm. I did not for one second think we were walking out of that building, which is why for a really long time after I had a very hard time. I mean, I still have a very hard time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you see my anxiety. I mean, I still have a very hard time, but. Um, because it was so unimag it was so unimaginable, A, that we actually fit in that space and being the first classroom that he didn't find us. Mm -hmm. Unimaginable. Yep. I, I you know, but, being, being a Christian, I believe God was looking out for you guys and somehow you guys were protected, um, protected with that too. And it, to me, it was amazing because I remember too, our, our first few times even talking, we would you would share, I would ask you, you know, always wanting to learn what can we do to make, mm -hmm. make our school safer. And I remember you saying too that the kids were, they were starting to get the emotional roller coaster in that room. Yeah. It's dark, right? It's, it was, um, no, we had the light on. Yeah, the light I on. I didn't turn the light off. So it's, I should have. It's scary. The room is scary. It's small. They're hearing what you're hearing, the gunshots, people dying. Um, and their little brains are trying to process it and you're keeping them quiet. And I remember one little boy told you something that 
he, yeah, I think you know what one I'm talking yeah, about. Said, and it was such his personality. I mean, a first grade boy, sort of not to be typical, but you know, they're boisterous and they're full of energy yes, for the most totally part. Are. I mean, that's kind of just the experience mm -hmm. of my, you know, seven years teaching first grade. Um, but this one boy in particular was just very, and he said, you know, whispered, you know, Miss Roig, I go to karate every week and I do a really good job while I'm there. And I think I could be very helpful with <laughs> the bad guy out there. Can you let me out? Getting you out. But, but similar to the little boy in, oh, yeah. in classroom too, mm -hmm. right? Like wanting to, to be... I don't want to use the word hero because I don't like that word either, but like wanting to help. Wanting to help. Wanting to help. Yes. Wanting to help. And, and I, I take it too, that, that kid's a little badass. He must have been a purple belt, minimally, to take on a grown adult with a gun. But you instilled He's something. Yellow, for a white. yellow belt? <laughs> probably. I mean, <laughs> you, just like. You instilled in him, though, <clears throat> bravery. And, and this, too, is what we try to teach to school staff is that you could be facing the worst moment, but those kids are looking to you mm -hmm. to see what you are doing. Yeah. If you went into that room, you broke down, you cried, the yeah. kids would have mimicked Correct. and done what you did, 100%. but instead, you're empowering them and pushing them that we're going to get home for Christmas. Correct. And I remember you saying, I didn't even truly believe that we no. were going to get out of here. No, not at all. But you're putting on the face of bravery. Mm -hmm. You're telling them, convincing them so that they're quiet, and not only quiet, but to the point of, I will fight to get us out of here. To me, that is an incredible statement to teachers, to um, school staff, that we want you to understand that your leadership in these tragic times, and it could be a kid chokes and dies or has a heart attack and dies at school, but the way that you are leading those students and those kids at that moment, whether you are a custodian, mm -hmm. um, a bus driver, sure. it doesn't matter that they're looking up to you as that adult and the person that's gonna protect them, whether they're seniors in high school or they're in kindergarten or first right. grade, and you, you did it. How long were you in that bathroom with it barricaded and? Mm -hmm. And keeping them quiet. Yeah, I didn't have. A, I don't wear a watch. I didn't have a watch. I didn't have my phone. I still to this day have never recovered my phone. Um, I can only imagine that someone grabbed it because it was right next to the door, trying to look for help. Yep. And it became part of the crime scene. I, you know, I don't. I didn't ask. I did not want it back. Um, but so we were in there uh, about forty-five minutes. Wow. An eternity. We were the last class people rescued and found from the school. And when they came to, it, it's not like a school administrator came in and said, okay, this is over, you guys can come out. What, what happened and who, no. who showed and, up at your door? And, yeah, well, so they, obviously they had moved the bookcase. Yeah. So there's a knock on the actual door. And I was terrified because I, you know, I thought, okay, that he's found us. Mm -hmm. Not to be, I just assumed it was a he. Well, 99% um, of the time, And so right. I whispered, I don't remember which student, but I said, ask who's there. And I believe it was a, male, a boy student, and he said, who, who is it? And they said, hey, little buddy, it's the police. We're here to help you. You know, please open the door. Please unlock the door. After my student asked who's there, and they said, hey, little fella, it's the police. We're here to help you. I then spoke, and I said, you know, if you're the police, we need your badge. Thinking, like, okay, this will make me feel better, right? No, no. It must have been let down because when I got my first badge as a cop, I felt like it was fake. They totally. handed it to me, and I'm like, totally. This and that's is what it? I said. And, and so, and that's what, so I, it, you know, they slid it under, of course there's, you know, I'm there, but there's students. So I think one of my students like was able to sort of bend down and get it and hand it to me. And I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm like, this is something my kids, this is not real. So now I'm like really nervous. But I'm, I'm glad you were this defensive because I'm though like, still. You're um, not really the police yep. if this is your badge. This is like plastic, <laughs> which was probably really offensive. <laughs> but and, they do kind of feel it. They're cheap then, metal. Yeah. So. Are they? Yeah. And then, so then I said to them, you know, if you have the keys, you need, you need to figure out a way to open the door. And um, it was a pop lock, so it needed something to be pushed into it. And so it was pretty easy to get in. I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah. And so the door popped open and pushed in, and we were greeted by an entire SWAT team I bet. head to toe. You know, too, just off the topic, I'm thinking, too, my years of SWAT, mm -hmm. you had badges that were sewn on your uniform. You didn't want extra stuff. You didn't want a badge in your, your pocket in a wallet because you need fast movement. So they were scrambling. So they were something. probably scrambling, calling someone on, get me a badge in here quick to get you a badge. <laughs> and and like, they're probably is, thinking as cops, because they don't work enough. Yeah. This part of the problem in the U.S. is that cops and the school districts don't work together enough to understand, too. They're probably like, this crazy woman has these kids in there and doesn't believe we're the police and yeah, there's yeah. a whole SWAT team. So they probably scrambled to get that for yeah, you yeah. and you made them well, still I, pop it. Well, it's great to me. I don't know, but I was told by a woman like two years after the tragedy, 
Um, I was at a school in New Jersey speaking, and the woman came up to me after, and she said, you know, my husband's best friend led that SWAT team in. Wow. Um, and he, to this day, has no words for the sight they saw because they thought they were rescuing the two of you. That's amazing. They thought they were rescuing me and the little boy who spoke. They, I, I like, heard, they had no clue. I heard that, that through the police officers at yours. Class. Afterwards, too. And I had seen you on the news, so I was aware of what was going on that night. But um, that when they said we went into Miss um, Roig's room at the time, you weren't married, right? Yes. So Miss mm-hmm. Roig's room, and there were 15 kids in this little bit. We never thought you could fit more than five in there. Nonetheless, a whole class, and they Neither were amazed that they just kept like a clown car. They kept coming out and coming out and coming and out. And it was like I remember they had to like pull them at first because like we were literally like they were just like pulling kids out, and then t- until we were like kind of able to comfortably. And because we were in there such a long time that we were like squished. How did they get you out of the building too? I mean, it, we took a we took a left, so and that's went, so I held it together in the bathroom. I did, God knows how, but I did. Mm-hmm. But the second I saw them. Like my state, you know, like police officers with their machine guns and their body armor. You could let your emotions. I just grabbed two of my kids' hands. I could not tell you which two. I have absolutely no idea. And I was hysterical. And I just followed, like, we just ran out of, like, I followed their direction, Mm -hmm. but I just kept asking them over and over and over and over, how do you know we're safe? How do you know whoever did this is gone? How do you, like, and obviously. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, but what if there's someone else? I know. How do you know? How do you know there's not someone mm-hmm. else? You know, and I remember like running through the parking lot because we had to go to the firehouse, holding my two kids' hands and just like, I mean, just like looking in the bushes and looking behind cars. Knowing and, there's someone somewhere. Yeah, and I felt that way for. I mean, I still kind of feel that way, but like you probably noticed, like when I look and. Um, I've been with you enough. I know. I know how you are, and I feel you, that you're, way still. you're actually a lot like police officers. That combat mindset again that we talked about, the accelerated situational awareness. Cops are constantly not liking mm-hmm. someone behind them, around them. There was a guy following up, me on the highway today, and I was well, like, "He's probably had to, the same way." Like, <laughs> no, I know, but it, like, I'm like, Too I need long. to get. So he like finally went around me. I'm like, <laughs> but that keeping the space at traffic lights, I've taught my all my kids. I got five of my six kids driving now. Yeah, that's crazy. You keep that one for car accidents, but anyone tries to rob you, jump in your car, um, any you're able to pull away, and these are all Danger. things that have come from that. But your your emotional release at that moment too. Um, I've had quite a few where they keep it together, and this is what we try to stress again to, to the school districts, or even if you're at a church or a doctor's office, keeping that composure and fighting through what your body wants to do. You, that, that point of you knew it was safe to l- release and let go, 100% you should be crying and be hysterical, mm-hmm. but you knew that you were safer, but you still didn't feel 100% safe. No. Because you were, you've just been through such a traumatizing experience. And, well, and they weren't really giving me answers. Yes. They were like, we just know you're safe. I'm like, but what do you mean? Yep. You know, like they're like, this is what thing. We're always <laughs> safe. Like, great. Thanks for sticking us with her. And, and <laughs> too, there, questions. There, there is very limited information. If, right. if you're not on the front lines, that. they don't know other than the threat's been taken out, but they're not, they don't want to tell you that Correct. he's been shot it's or he's dead or right. killed himself. Um, but even then, that wasn't, that wasn't going to satisfy you no. anyways. Even if they said he committed suicide, you're still thinking there's, there's someone, someone else. else. Like his friend is coming. He Correct. told his friend to come at 10. Mm-hmm. So, but again, that's but, my... <laughs> but two, there is nothing wrong with that mindset as we look at Columbine, where there's multiple shooters and they're trying to draw people out. Jonesboro, Arkansas. Yeah. Another one in um, Colorado just a few years ago where two attackers. So it's the right mindset. It's just very sad to know that the trauma that you and the, the kids right. are going through at that moment. You coming out of that too... I do want to talk about what, what's gone on for the past 10 years and what you've done, but a couple questions for you just to touch on. Have you stayed in touch with any of the families or the kids, mm-hmm. and what did you want to do from that point on? I know you stayed with your students mm-hmm. and um, eventually stopped working at the school district, mm-hmm. and you've written a book. You've met That's the President questions. of the United States. You've, Three of but, them. Yeah, <laughs> going, going through, and you know your, your life took a big turn. Mm-hmm at this moment, and I, I know you well enough that none of it was for fame, popularity, any of that. Oh Go back to December yours, 13th in a heartbeat. Yours was to uh, protect the kids, love the kids, and make people aware of what's going on, and sadly their country is still not aware enough. Mm-hmm. But what, what happened, so... Which question? After, you well, I, <laughs> I want you to touch on that as you tell the story, too, of what, what happened from there. You. What happened from there? Okay, it's a long journey. Okay, so let me start here. 
So in the days and the weeks that followed December 14th, um, two things were very much at play. The first was that I was terrified of life, which was pretty, even though I had always been sort of afraid and anxious, it was a very foreign feeling, mm -hmm. being terrified of life. I was always pretty independent, like a go-getter, you know. With, and so being terrified of life was new. Like mm -hmm. not being able to leave my house, not being able to drive a car, just being like paralyzed with fear was a really infuriating foreign feeling. Yeah. So that was one thing that was very much in play. The second thing was that I was desperately trying to answer this long list of questions that really all circled around why. Why our school? Mm -hmm. Why innocent, innocent lives? 20 of whom were first graders that my kids played with every single day, and many of whom were siblings of kids that I, former students, like wow. why? And so eventually what I realized was that I couldn't continue down this path, right? I could not continue down a path where I was terrified of life, and I couldn't keep banging my head, metaphorically speaking, against a wall, trying to answer the long list mm -hmm. of whys. I realized that I'm never going to answer those whys. Not then, not now, not ever. And that was a really powerful realization. I think for so many of us in life, when we are confronted with the hard stuff, which we all are on mm -hmm. all different levels, we often spend so much time grappling with questions that we are never going to answer. And we, like, lead it, we let it lead us to frustration. Mm -hmm. And we forget in those moments that there are so many questions that can be answered. And that there's so much power to be found there, right? And so for myself, I realized, okay, I can't answer all of this, but there are two questions I absolutely can answer and that I need to. And I can't say that way back then it was articulated in my mind this way, but this is absolutely what happened. The two questions were, how do I make sure this day does not define us? Because mm -hmm. at first that's what was happening, my students and I. How do we take our control back? Because right? you didn't stop working. No. You, you said you, were, you could not leave the house alone. But that didn't mean that you abandoned your kids and didn't go back to work. Yeah, my mom met me every morning hmm. and I sat in my classroom every day because I like literally could not be alone. Um, so God bless her for that. Um, so the two questions. And so, yeah. you know, this other, so I have the questions, right? That's one component. And then the other component is, my God, I'm terrified of life, right? Mm -hmm. So how do I overcome that, right? Like, I don't want to be terrified of life forever, right. of all the parts of life. And so those two questions were the way. Like, I didn't know the path, but yeah. I knew that if I answered this not controlling us and this not defining us, well, then I'm not terrified, yeah. right? I agree. So I set out to answer these two questions, having no idea how, and we go back to school. We go back to school. So our superintendent at the time wanted us to go back to school on Tuesday morning. Now, oh for clarity, the tragedy happened Friday morning. So we have a weekend, Saturday, Sunday, like we would have always had. And she, in a meeting, told us she was going to give us Monday to grieve. So thanks. Sorry, I just like no, it's unreal. No, I, I love it. I love it that you're pointing it out because it needs to be pointed they, out. They become they become like robots horrific. of we have a job horrific. to do. We don't get state money if we're not teaching. We're not, and, and we see this nationwide. But let's look at just less than Being a month a ago, being. an NFL football game where the Buffalo Bills yeah. guy gets hit did so right hard. Thing. Whatever happened, he has a heart attack on the field. And they did the right and thing. And they end the game. As they should have. As they absolutely should have. And those are grown warrior men Being doing paid it. Lots that of money. You see them crying on the sidelines, both sidelines crying for this guy. And here we have a tragedy in a school with these kids. And on Tuesday, four days from now, you're going to be back and be in school. What? She actually What idiot had, thinks of that? I don't care if she hears it. But she who actually thinks of that? had the audacity. She had the audacity right after saying we're going to give you Monday to grieve to actually right after that say, and if you would like to attend one of the 26 funerals, we'll work to get you a sub. Now, I don't know how that hits you, but as a person who came very close to losing my life in that building and thought that I was going to for 45 minutes, having her say that to me, to all of us, um, was just... It was a whole other trauma. Like, you don't appreciate or respect the lives lost. You don't appreciate or respect any of the lives sitting here now. Mm -hmm. You have absolutely no idea what you're, like, what you're doing here. And so I hope it could be a lesson. Well, I don't hope it could be a lesson because I hope this absolutely never happens again. So I hope that it's not a lesson that anyone else has to go through. I mean, yes. that is my true to God hope. I don't, I don't wish it on anyone ever, 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 ever. Um, I hope that 
in hard times, right? That people in leadership positions do better, know better, do better, because I agree. The, the not job okay. is never more important not than okay. the person. No matter what career you're in and what's going on, the people are more important, and especially when it comes to kids, because you know, for years through my police career, through being a father, always tried to justify Columbine of they're older, something must have been going, it must have been bullying. Not not that it's right or correct, as in justifying, but that way of protecting that. I hope this doesn't happen to my kids when they're at school. There, and then when it happens at an elementary school, is like there is no, there is no justice. So you being circling that question, circling that question, that I agree will never be answered. It's just pure evil. Correct. Um, even even with Parkland, where the shooter lives, he's still never going to give a real answer on what went on. He's just going to play games like he has, and you wanting to get that to move forward and get these kids to move forward. You're now back at school and mm -hmm. she's, she's telling you Tuesday, do you remember when you went back to? Yeah. So, and you didn't go back to that school building. No. Well, that's the thing too. Where were it's we evidence. going? Where were we going? We went back to school. So teachers went back on January 2nd. Kids came back on January 3rd. That's that still really right. fast. Yep. And we went back to a school that was completely not ready for us. It was mm -hmm. a school that had been closed down, abandoned for years. Um, it was a two-story, actually three-story, but two were two stories were in use. We were Sandy Hook was a one-floor building. Mm -hmm. My kids were like me, shells of themselves, as uh, understandably. Absolutely. I'm not saying that. I mean, they were. It was a lot, mm -hmm. right? And now we're in a building that we have a floor above us, and people are dragging furniture. And there's Making loud noises, noises. So. and my kids are. I mean, I had one student especially who just would. Just rock. Mm -hmm like ball themselves up and just rock. Um, so, I mean, we were just trying, we were just trying to get through the day. I mean, forget like education and academics. And oh, we were yeah. just like listening to Christmas music and coloring in January. I mean, to be honest with you. And then, you know, time passed. My mom was still coming with me. So she's there to, you know, cause now we're in a classroom with no bathroom. Mm -hmm. My kids are very aware that we survived because of the bathroom and they're asking oh, me gone. constantly. What if that, what if a scary man comes here, Miss Rogan? They're looking around. And they asked me every day what we do. I had a little girl who could not return to school without her mom for over two months because I couldn't answer the question. Right. Wasn't gonna lie. Like there's no answer. Say? Right. Which I kept asking our superintendent, asking our superintendent to help me come up with an answer. And she said, This is the safest school in America. There's nothing to worry about. Hmm. Like just so insensitive. Like you don't get it. Like you're not you're not understanding. Like my kids are six and they've almost lost their lives and they want a simple question answered. They want a plan. They want to know at home with their parents, I know that no scary man is coming here, but they want to know that if a scary man does, well, yeah. do you know what she told their parents? Right. She told them Miss Reg saved them once, she'd do it again. That is like insane. That is like the most insane thing you could ever say to someone. Wow. Like this is like common sense. This is mental health. This is a little kid needs a plan. This yep. is not like your adult, no better, me, do better, do yes. better. I share it, no better, do better. No better, do better. It, it's almost no like a political better. position or horrible. leadership that it, it does, but it needs to change and it, it needs, needs to, to be different. And it has continued where they don't shut down, they don't close, they, um, you know, a tragic event that they should never see. You know, less than 10% of our military sees combat. And, and I take that too, if that 10% of combat, how many of them have seen 20 dead kids at mm -hmm. once? Like. Mm -hmm. What has gone on here is worse than many more war stories and that I've heard and things that have gone on and then it's back to normal, back to normal let's go. And Kids are resilient. And, and a big part of it too, right, is they need this structure, they need this, they need that. They need to be loved and safe and, and with their families and all of that, just like you did even at 29 years old. Mm -hmm needing your mom, these kids needed their mothers and their fathers. And, and most of them were there. Yeah. I mean, so, our classroom door was like, come on in, take yeah. a seat, wherever, you know, I mean, it, it was. But you guys not only made it through that year, is that when you started kind of your not-for-profit, which is uh, Classes yeah. for Classes? So the idea was born in my classroom. Yep. Yep. And it I came from a place, yeah, it came from a place of, we were inundated in the most positive way with gifts. People from around the world wanted us to feel, not just my class, the, the community, wanted us to feel loved and supported mm -hmm. and connected. And they did that by sending us stuff. I mean, boxes of things came in. 
I mean, every day I would say my kids were getting something, a Happy Meal party, crumbs, cupcakes, recess toys, electronics, stuffed animals, I mean, you name it. They showed up. And it was amazing, because my kids were, you know, smiling yeah. and, and feeling joy, which was really important. I would say after about maybe two weeks of all these, you know, boxes arriving at our door in the morning mm -hmm. and giving to my kids, giving and giving, giving, I stepped back and I realized that it needed to become a teachable moment. I could not sit back and allow my kids to just get and get and get and think that that's the way the world works because it's not the way the world works. Right. You know, my parents raised me very much so that when you get, you give. When somebody does for you, you do for someone else and you help however you can. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that this was a pay it forward lesson I needed to teach my kids. So it was, I don't remember what day of the week it was, but it was after lunch before recess. I came back into the classroom, they sat down on the rug, and I put an another box of recess toys. <clears throat> I started pulling, uh, sorry, yeah, I started pulling items out. And they were so excited, and I said, this is, you know, th these are for our classroom, for you to play with. Then I read on the smart board a book called, I always pronounce her name wrong, Boxes for Katja. It's K-A-T-J-E. It's a little girl, I think she's in Russia. Okay. And it's um, a story about World War II, I believe, or World War I. I'm not a history buff, but. <laughs> Anywho, her family is in a war-torn country and is supported throughout that time. And then when she gets to a place with her family where they're on the other side, they're then able to help someone else. Wow. So we read this book, and then we went back to talking about the gifts. And I said, why did somebody send this to us? And now we're on like day 10, right? So they're oh, like yeah. used to it. Why are, why are people sending us all these things? And their hands raised and they said, well, they, they want us to feel loved. They want us to feel supported, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, absolutely. And then I posed sort of the trickier question. I said, what's our job now? Pay it forward is a lofty concept for yeah. a six-year-old. Their hands raised and they said, well, we should help someone. We should send a gift to someone else. We so, should so make someone else feel happy. And I said, yes. And I was ready for recess, ready to like sit in my chair and just like, and yet the most amazing thing happened, their hands all started to raise and they said, well, who are we going to help? And how are we going to help them? And what are we going to send? Mm -hmm. You have to imagine that my kids, you know, not even a month prior to this moment, have lived through, or were living through the worst, you know, evil darkness you ever could. And yet oh, yeah. here they are in front of me feeling hopeful and excited and inspired about helping someone else, connecting mm -hmm. with someone else. It was a true light bulb moment of number one, here's the answer to both my questions, That's awesome. right? Evil can't define you mm -hmm. if you choose to focus on something else and you absolutely get your control back when you help someone else. I agree. Um, and so that's what we did. We reached out to a classroom in Tennessee, said, how can we help? What do you need? They said a Mimeo Teach, which is very similar to a smart board. Mm -hmm. And we had also been mailed money. So we mailed them, you know, however much that was for them to buy that. That's and awesome. That was, that was and did the your, beginning. Were your kids able to connect with the kids in that class too um, Thank you cards. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, nothing crazy. Because well, again, this was like a tiny seed of an idea. I, I remember, man, going back to kindergarten or first grade where we sent a letter to, I forget what country, to another country over in Europe mm -hmm. and sent a letter, you know, I'm here in America, I'm in yeah. first grade and telling them, you know, we put a piece of candy in there, Jolly Rancher or something and sent it and getting a thank you note back and hearing about yeah. That was like a massive deal. And all you did was give them a piece of candy. Yeah, connecting. And they sent something to us too, to yeah. thank us. So I, I can imagine too, these kids are through hell. Yeah. They're pushing forward. They're, they're taking the baby steps, but they're coming up from a, a lesson that you taught and what was heavy on your heart was, we need to do something from this where we mm -hmm. can positively affect compared to coming in and just making it through a day. Right. So Good and those, bad are both always present. Mm -hmm. It's a choice which to focus your energy on. I agree. So we made a choice. And that, did you end up doing that basically throughout the school year? Because things... So what happened, so we reached out, we, the class was in Tennessee. That class in Tennessee was then inspired and they reached out to a classroom in Arizona. And after those sort of connections there, that's when I really got to thinking and organizing and saying, this is bigger than my class. This needs to be a website, obviously, because I can't be everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So it needs to live online so everyone can access it. And somehow it came to me, well, it needs to be a nonprofit because I just, that was the only thing I could figure out for it. Yep. And so that's how it came to be. And it started going. And you're still doing that to this day? Mm -hmm. 
yeah, we just launched our seventh website. That's incredible. We're completely focused now on, we consider ourselves a gallery for teachers to showcase how their students choose to be kind. That's awesome. And I will say, and this, hopefully it will, it's, a, it's good tears for this one, not, not sad tears. Um, I will say that almost every single time I go into a school, because I'll lead this mini lesson a lot mm -hmm. when I get to actually go into schools, and talk about how kindness is a choice and why are we gonna to choose to be kind and why do you choose to be kind. Almost always when they write and illustrate about how they're gonna to choose to be kind and how that choice makes a difference, they write and illustrate about how it'll change the world. That's nice. Which, is, well, it's like more than nice because it's like, you know, Classes for Classes ultimately was founded because what happened on that day was so full of hate. Mm -hmm so much hate and anger and just horrible feelings, mm -hmm. right? And so if we teach kids from five years old, four years old, that they're connected and that they don't have to be best friends, but that they care about one, one yes. another and that they care about, you know, another person's feelings and their well-being and, you know, all of that. God, I sincerely hope that if they're truly engaged in that from five throughout their educational career, that, that, that they don't have hateful feelings, it does. right? It like changes how do, the world. you know, it does. It does. Well, it has the potential to, if we really buy into it. I think our country, unfortunately, you know, we don't do the best job at it. I remember sitting down with one of our U.S. senators, one of the heads, U.S. senators that have been there for a long time, and he says, Tom, why, why do you think this keeps happening and getting worse? And I said, our children have lost respect, love, and caring about their fellow man. There's so many reasons. It, 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 and we just see where society is falling apart and instead of caring and looking out for, and you see it on TikToks now, you see it on these oh stitches or whatever Social it's called media. where oh, they're videotaping so themselves coming up to the homeless guy and helping him. Oh. That's their way of being generous compared to when no one's looking, what are you doing? Going to a soup kitchen on a and Saturday And why do you do it? Because if, if that person that's thinking of harming themselves, harming someone else, can feel loved and feel purpose and feel cared for, that is going to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. It is. Because they're then going to care about somebody 100%. and not want to hurt. And so I believe that is a big dynamic mm -hmm. changer for us and why I've always supported um, what you, you do and, and why you're doing it. And, yeah. um, you know, to me, you even wrote a book too. Um, Choosing hope. Yep. That we will buy in bulk here, and then we give out. <laughs> we give out too when we go out and teach. We give it to um, different staff members at school districts all over the nation, and it's a gift we love to give too because, you know, we went through some hard stuff with talking today, but it's not all. It it is a it is a powerful message about moving forward, mm -hmm. and having purpose and caring, and um, I imagine too you you might like we have we'll get flack from people of you're doing this to get rich, you're doing this to be, there is no money in Active Shooter, there is, it is a fight to do anything, and I know your heart well enough, there is none of that. And the people, people who- people say something about you, it's none of your business. <laughs> and people who talk about other people, it's a reflection of how they feel about themselves. I agree. 100%. That they would do it to make money. 100%. They would do it not, and truly I, what I see in you is that your fight did and not I've made stop. Not one not one penny of royalties off choosing yeah. hope. So, <laughs> if anyone's <laughs> listening and watching, yeah. But and what I see like is that your fight not did not stop on December fourteenth yeah. in that classroom, in that bathroom, um, running out of the building. Your fight didn't stop. Your fight has continued yeah. um, to make a difference, um, and you haven't stopped teaching. As in, you're, you're not teaching in a classroom, but you continue to teach every year, all the time, teaching the teachers, teaching the. Uh, staff and even sometimes with students, you know, you're constantly fighting to make this difference yeah. that is just absolutely incredible. And, and to us, it, it's a motivator for me, for my team, for um, one training and our team over there that's out working with, with schools. It's also one training as a not for profit like you. It's not a money maker, if anything. It, there are a lot of donations come mm -hmm. from this side of the company, the construction side of glass and film. And you know something that I wanted to share with you, because of um, Sandy Hook and the attack and your description too of him coming to those doors, that um, we do security assessments, we do training, mm -hmm. and we do glass work. And I didn't know really anything about glass other than the Bearcat that I sat in in SWAT had bullet resistant glass that would stop probably a 50 cal. <laughs> and, and that's all I knew 
But my thought was, is what can we do to protect the schools more? If there's this um, glass and film out there that can slow down a hurricane, or we, there's got to be something. And as we looked into it, it was so expensive for schools, no one could afford it. Right. Our goal was to start and get those prices down to get them something that actually works and is made to stop someone with a gun. And we've successfully done that. You're sitting in our national headquarters. It's beautiful. And we took the price of glass and window films that were about $100 a square foot. It's 10 years later and inflation has been terrible, right? This past two years. And we are down in the 40 and $50 mark a square foot. And the competitors have to do it too because we've crippled them. They have to come up with a better product. They well, have to pass tests. And that came from though at Sandy Hook. And with that too, I share all of that because you know the, the great report that we had was a school in New York out near Rochester where your best friend lives. It was attacked about five years ago and the attacker was kept at bay because the security assessment broke down what they needed and how they needed it. Um, we ended up going in and putting, at the time, window film on their glass entries and their uh, classroom doors and the, the fire doors there. And the attacker showed up tweeting that he's gonna kill just out of a psych ward, high on cocaine, an expelled student. Very similar to what we saw down in Parkland and we were able to keep him at bay for almost eight minutes. No one was injured, no one was killed except for him, and that comes from me standing in front of the TV as a SWAT operator, a dad of six, husband to a teacher, and looking at it and saying, something needs to be done. There is too much of a gap between schools and law enforcement. We've gotta do this different. Mm -hmm. And because of all of those things, we were able to save lives that day. Mm -hmm. And we've had other schools where they've been close to attacks, and because they've been trained right, because they've had the situational awareness that this isn't right, we need to do something. Right. Lives have been saved, people have been arrested, it's been cut off and stopped. And I, that, that is worth more than any money, anything you'll ever make, anything you'll ever do. And people are like, you're running multi-millions of dollars in work, I'm not a millionaire. It's not because I spend money, I make right. less than some of my employees, and not because I'm so humble, but if we're gonna keep our prices down, we're gonna continue to make a difference this is how we have to run it and how we have to do it. Just like you with classes for classes. It's never been a money thing. You're not taking money for it in your fight for this. I mean, even today, driving out on a snowy day through New York. It wasn't to, snowing until I got here. So, <laughs> but here you are making sacrifices away from your daughter, away from your husband and, well, and with us because of, because of your passion to continue to do this. And I don't see this stopping um, even when you're old and gray and when you pass away, that someone's going to carry when on that torch. When I'm old and gray? Yes. <laughs> I think we've arrived there. You're, you're, co you're covering it well, so. I mean, I when, when I met you, I had a beautiful gray. black beard, and now it's now it's Life. straight gray, so. Well, better than the alternative. Yeah, so, but I, I, I love that you are here. I love that you continue to Thanks fight, that you continue me. to tell people, and um, even when you're faced with opposition of the people who your old superintendent, they're, they're still out there. Sure. That we're safe, there's nothing to worry about, and there's some of the unsafest schools mm -hmm. in our country, and there's a false sense of security with the staff because my superintendent said it, or some police officer said it, we're the safest. They're not even close, and I know you've run into that opposition of, you need to make changes, this is what happened to me, and you're doing it here, and, and you fight that, and I love it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so important, you know, I mean, lived experience is, is the greatest teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, how do you not, how do you not listen to the stories of people who have been there and, yep. and, and gone through it and take, take their suggestions? Like, how do you just say no, you know? Very close-minded, yep. unfortunately. And hopefully you keep opening the minds at teaching of, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't want someone to learn that lesson that we did with our superintendent. I want them to see what happened. I know. Well, say, I, okay, I really try time. to, like with you, I talk about it because I think it really makes a lot of sense in the space where you're in of, mm -hmm. you, know, enact, you know, enacting real change in school safety, at, you know, in schools across, that Armored One is enacting across the United States. For me, I typically don't talk about it because mm -hmm. for me, like it's not my message. Do you know what I mean? Like I don't know how to make schools. I mean, I know my own lived experience, yeah. but I don't like really know exactly what to do. You're the expert because you're law enforcement and you have that background and you can look at it and say, you know, this glass and this here, and you know, this is what's gonna make it safe. For me, you know, my teaching that I'm so passionate about is how to move forward from the hard stuff, right? Yeah. Like it's choosing hope, moving forward from life's darkest hours. Because what I realized very early on when I first started, you know, 10 years ago, going out and sharing my story, which I did at first with like such trepidation. Someone asked and I was like, what, they want me? What do they want me? 
I was mm -hmm. like, they want me to talk for an hour? What? What am I going to say for an hour? And I went and I thought, oh my gosh, and I had prepared, you know, I had been doing so much writing in my healing and I got up on the stage and I spoke and it was the Pennsylvania School Board Association, so it was all their superintendents. And I got down after and, you know, the line forms people who want to say hello or share with you or whatever. And a few people back, and I'll never forget it, um, she said, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that you're here today, but I'm, I'm more happy that my best friend is. And she's, you know, back in line. Um, she was diagnosed with, you know, pretty severe cancer oh. recently. And um, she really needed to hear your message. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that 10 years later, and the reason that I still go out, and sometimes now it's virtual, but you know, I'm still out speaking, is because every single time I've spoken, every single time, someone has shared their heart stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like this great connector, right? And it's so important that we share our own heart stuff so that we know that we're not alone, and mm -hmm. you know, that person knows they're not alone, and that it's okay to to be going through it and that you can come out on the other side yes, and I make agree. a choice. So. And I've, I've personally witnessed it when you've come with one training yeah. and taught and seen the lines form and have, and it, it's not all active shooter. Like no. there is that connection of peer to peer, you to other teachers, teachers and staff sure. that it's a fear of theirs. And almost every one of them sure. I'm sure have that sure. worry and that fear. But when they come up to you and talk about cancer or their mm -hmm. friend dying or their Suicide. family member, mm -hmm. all of that, that Human it's, experience. it's tragedy. Right. and it is very hard to grab a hold of. And going way back to the beginning of our talk is when people come up to you and they say something dumb to you about what you've been through, it, it's been six months, you should be over this. Um, Must they, be getting easier. They, yes, they have not been through a major tragedy. Mm -hmm. They've had bad things happen, right. but they have not had a major tragedy yet. And it's, it's ignorance because it hasn't been experienced. And I did that with my wife when her sister and her right. niece died. Right. We're, we're sitting next to the Elizabeth room, which is our conference room named after my niece on my wife's side, my 20-year-old niece who died in a car accident right. with her mom, which I know you know about, and, but people coming through, and I, I did not understand with my wife even how to talk to her and do that right. because I had grandparents die. They're right. supposed to die before Very you. Very different. But your brother dying at 40 Correct. in the middle of the night changed everything, and mm -hmm. that's where your empathy, and because now you're in it together. Mm -hmm. We're all in this together mm -hmm. on that, and that's yeah, really where you're speaking, your book makes a difference. That, right is way beyond schools and active shooter and secure, any of that stuff. Yeah. It is truly about moving forward from tragedy and you're going to have a tragedy in your life and how you come through it makes you um, either stronger, mm -hmm. weaker, or uh, it crushes you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was great 100%. talking with you. I <laughs> love <too>. it. <laughs>